On this week's Vaticano, Pope Francis concludes the year of faith with thousands of faithful in St. Peter's Square and millions more tuning in around the globe. Archbishop Rino Fisichella looks back at the fruits of the year gone by. This, plus Cardinal Joseph Zen of Hong Kong, speaks about the difficulties of being Catholic in China, Rome's Pontifical Canadian College marks its 125th year, and Pope Francis continues to reach out to sportsmen. Also a look at a couple of American initiatives from up on Rome's Janiculum Hill, media training for future priests, and the priests on sabbatical program. Both are taking off. All this coming up. On November the 24th, Pope Francis closed the Year of Faith, inaugurated just over a year before by Benedict XVI. La solennità odierna di Cristo, Re dell'Universo. Today's solemnity of our Lord Jesus Christ, King of the Universe, the crowning of the liturgical year, also marks the conclusion of the Year of Faith, opened by Pope Benedict XVI, to whom our thoughts now turn with affection and gratitude for this gift which he has given us. By this providential initiative, he gave us an opportunity to rediscover the beauty of the journey of faith, begun on the day of our baptism, which made us children of God and brothers and sisters in the Church, a journey which has as its ultimate end our full encounter with God, and throughout which the Holy Spirit purifies us, lifts us up, and sanctifies us, so that we may enter into the happiness for which our hearts long. The Pope then spoke of Jesus Christ as the center of creation, the center of his people, and the center of history. As such, Pope Francis said, Christ is the center of the history of every individual, and each is called to follow him. Today, we can all think of our own history, our own journey. Each of us has his or her own history. We think of our mistakes, our sins, our good times, and our bleak times. We would do well, each one of us on this day, to think about our own personal history, to look at Jesus and to keep telling him sincerely and quietly, remember me, Lord, now that you are in your kingdom. Jesus, remember me because I want to be good, because I just don't have the strength. I am a sinner, I am a sinner, but remember me, Jesus. You can remember me because you are at the center. You are truly in your kingdom. How beautiful this is. Let us all do this today, each one of us in his or her own heart, again and again. Remember me, Lord, you who are at the center, you who are in your kingdom. Jesus' promise to the good thief gives us great hope. It tells us that God's grace is always greater than the prayer which sought it. The Lord always grants more. He is so generous. He always gives more than what he had been asked. You ask him to remember you, and he brings you into his kingdom. Let us go forward together on this journey. Andiamo tutti insieme su questa strada. During the Mass, attended by more than 100,000 people, the bones of St. Peter were present in this bronze box. It's the first time they've ever been exposed at a public event. There were several additional initiatives that marked the Feast of Christ the King in the Vatican. A rare special collection was taken up for the victims of the typhoon in the Philippines. And these were some of the 36 representatives to receive the first copies of Pope Francis' apostolic letter, titled Evangelii Gaudium, meant to guide the Church as it attempts to re-evangelize the secular West. All made for a fitting way to end this special year in the Church, this year of faith. This was the scene at the inauguration of the year of faith a year ago, and these, the words of Benedict XVI. Questi decenni è avanzata una desertificazione spirituale. Recent decades have seen the advance of a spiritual desertification. 
In the Council's time, it was already possible from a few tragic pages of history to know what a life or a world without God looked like. But now we see it every day around us. This void has spread. But it is in starting from the experience of this desert, from this void, that we can again discover the joy of believing, its vital importance for us, men and women. In the desert, we rediscover the value of what is essential for living. Thus, in today's world, there are innumerable signs, often expressed implicitly or negatively, of the thirst for God, for the ultimate meaning of life. At every event during the Year of Faith was the man in charge of its organizational details, Archbishop Rino Fisichella. In the midst of it all, he got a first-hand look at the state of faith and the devotion of the faithful today. Un bilancio profondamente positivo. It has been extremely positive, especially because we've experienced how God's grace works and in what way we're called to live the faith, abandoning ourselves evermore to the action of His grace. It is He who changes our hearts, the Lord, the Spirit that guides us. He changes our hearts, transforms us, and we are converted. But we must also say that it has been a moment in which we have been able to touch with our hands the great vitality of the Church as it lives out the faith. All of these events that we have experienced here have brought an enormous number of pilgrims to Rome. More than eight and a half million pilgrims have come here to profess the faith this year. But many others have been able to celebrate their faith in their communities, and dioceses, in their parishes. So I would say that this vitality of the Church has enabled us to look to the future with great hope. I would also bring up another dimension. We normally underscore the aspects of crisis and other negative aspects. This year has told us also that we have to look at the positive signs that are given to us at that capacity for true signs of the times that the Lord places before us and asks us to live with intensity. So the year of faith has asked us to live this way. One of its positive fruits has certainly been this vitality of the Church in expressing its enthusiasm and its own joy in living out the faith. The Year of Faith started with Mass on October the 11th, 2012, and spanned the end of the pontificate of Benedict XVI, a conclave, and the first eight months of Pope Francis' reign. Stay with us. After the break, we'll be back with the Pope and a couple of rugby teams and the 125th anniversary celebrations of the Canadian College in Rome. Thanks for watching. This is Vaticano. The Pontifical Canadian College is marking its 125th year with celebrations in the Eternal City. Cardinal Thomas Collins of Toronto was in Rome for the occasion. He himself once studied in Rome. The Canadian College has been a great benefit to the Church in Canada. Uh, it is, and we, it's now in its third college. We originally had a bigger one for about 50 students on Via Quattro Fontani, and then when I first came, there was one uh, the Czechoslovakian College were using briefly, and now we have the, the current one for about 30 students. And so I think in the history, it's changed the location a few times. Uh, and uh, there have been many different things, different popes have, have been there, and, but I think the key thing remains the same. It's the opportunity to study the faith uh, in, in Rome, which is really the center of the church, and especially to be close to the Holy Father, and to be close to the tombs of Peter and Paul, which is really the great apostles. Well, it certainly is important as the year of faith and a time when we think about studying our faith and also living it out. And that's what the people who come to study are, are meant to do. It's not just an intellectual gaining a knowledge of the faith, but also learning how to really be transformed by an experience of Christ our Lord and then going out and serving. 
all of the students who are here, all the priests who are sent from Canada uh, to come to the Canadian College are sent on a mission by their bishop. I've sent uh, many over the years, and I'll send one a year actually, I'm trying to do that. And they're sent to learn, but also to experience and then to come back and evangelize. So that's the key thing about what they're doing here. This year marks the sixth since Benedict XVI sent a letter to encourage Chinese Catholics in the faith. In it, he established new guidelines to help cooperation between underground Catholic communities and those officially registered with the government. The letter uh, is written in, um, uh, in clarity. And, uh, well, clarity is always uh, together with charity. So the tone of it is very conciliatory. Um, asking the communities itself um, <clears throat> uh, to stay firm in faith and also united. And unfortunately, uh, for some political and historical factors, uh, the communities uh, in China kind of divided uh, the communities uh, which um, the Catholic communities which are officially recognized by the government and, and there's, another community, there's other communities which are not yet recognized because uh, of the, I would say, the political factor. Um, those who are recognized officially, they have to follow um, mm, uh, in different degrees um, uh, the guidance of the Patriotic Association. In Benedict's June the 30th letter, he strongly criticized the limits placed by the Chinese government on the church's activities. Cardinal Joseph Zen believes the letter's interpretation was partly distorted by the Chinese government, but that Pope Francis may be able to reverse the damage. Somebody said that uh, the Holy Father wants everybody to be united, so there should be no more underground church. That was a big lie. It's not in the letter. It was not the intention of the Holy Father. So unfortunately, that letter was uh, partly uh, wasted because of this uh, 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 wrong way of, uh, of uh, understanding it. Huh? So it's a pity huh, that such a beautiful letter and, uh, and uh, uh, because of this uh, uh, wrong interpretation, uh, several people try to come out from the underground, uh, but then they, they meet the same uh, oppression, uh, uh, the same uh, uh, demand of a, a complete uh, surrender. Uh, and, and so uh, it, it, it was very painful, uh, all this... Uh, uh, effect. Uh, so uh, the, the letter was uh, not uh, accepted by the government and not uh, faithfully followed even by church people. Everybody waiting uh, and uh, we are full of confidence uh, in the wisdom of uh, Pope Francis. Uh, uh, he's a wise man, so I think uh, uh, he can do. But, uh, you know, uh, uh, everything depends also on the sincerity of the, the other part. Huh? If the other part uh, uh, is not ready to change, then uh, there's not much you can do unilaterally. The Vatican Department that oversees pastoral care for the sick and disabled held this conference in mid-November. It gave a look at the care of a section of society that often is forgotten. The theme of the conference, as we know, is very 
The theme of the conference is very current, the service of the church for the elderly and in the care of people affected by neurodegenerative diseases. With this conference, we want to let people know that the church is not only close to this type of sick person, but also their families, because we know that not all of the sick, especially those with Alzheimer's, are in institutions or care centers, but they stay with their families for years and years. And we would like to express our solidarity and closeness to these families and to these sick people. Discussion turned frequently to the existence of euthanasia, the possibility of ending a life deemed not worth living. This German doctor has made it his work to counter this utilitarian idea of humanity in favor of a Christian approach. The sustainable solution comes from a different anthropologic view, which is the Christian view. The Christian view that man is an image of God. So then, of course, you don't have to add anything to society. You have an inherent dignity. And that inherent dignity lifts you over any utilitarian thought. It makes, may actually be an anthropologic view that turns things a little bit around. That now the, um, the elderly sick person gives us a chance to bring a new meaning into the life of the care, the health care giver. So that uh, is another aspect, uh, aspect which um, lets, let me come to the firm conviction that the Christian anthropology is a basis for a sustainable, sustainable solution of our demographic change and the increase in neurodegenerative disease. After a brief pause, we'll be back with a couple of initiatives from Americans in Rome that are finding success in the education of priests. Thanks for watching. This is Vaticano. Pope Francis' favorite sport is soccer, so you can imagine that this meeting with the International Soccer Federation's president, Joseph Blatter, was a good one. The same morning, that of November the 22nd, he met with the national rugby squads of Italy and Argentina. <laughs> Much of Pope Francis, I mean, first of all, and I'll get to mercy in a second, but his approach, you know, as I understand it, he, he, first of all, he does like, he, he's a big soccer fan and he enjoys sports as sports, and he also is uh, interested in having the church go into the culture and engage the culture. And that's in a sense what we do, is to go share the good news in a proactive way. And I, that's my understanding of Pope Francis. And, and mercy, yes, I, I, I concur, Mercy is an important part of his papacy, maybe the foundation. And, you know, that's what we're trying to explain, that is, we have a God of mercy, not a God of judgment. The meeting comes just a month after the Vatican's Run for the Faith initiative, which brought thousands to St. Peter's Square to live out the relationship between sports and faith. If there's interest in sports and the church's perspective on sports. And one of the things we wish to share is the rich teaching history of, of the church, and, and mo many people aren't aware of that. I mean, you know, St. Paul, for example, who we like to refer to as the first sports writer, uh, speaks about the analogies of a prize fight, a race, and, you know, running for an eternal crown, and that's an important part of our theology of sports. And there's so much um, brilliant, uh, excellent uh, explication from the Holy Fathers. Pope Pius XII speaks beautifully in his encyclicals about the proper interaction between the body, the soul, and the mind, the body, mind, and the soul. Um, and in sports, sadly, a lot of people just look at it as some, in, in a pursuit of the body. So we want to explain that. You know, and, and Pope John Paul II considered to be the Pope athlete because he um, was so um, interested in sports himself and taught about sports, uh, had some great uh, 
teachings that we, we promote, we promulgate. And also Pope Benedict, interestingly, because Pope Benedict is not an athlete per se, um, is given one of the most beautiful, I think, um, uh, discussions of why sports is important. He was asked the question, in fact, in an audience, as to why does God care about sports? And that was the question. And he said, yes, God cares about sports because God cares about man and man cares about sports. So anything that's important to man is important to sport, is important to God. Wise as serpents, innocent as doves. The North American College wants its students to be ready to confront these times. To communicate their faith more clearly and effectively, their theology studies are now being supported by media training. I've been offering this workshop at the Pontifical North American College since 2010 and it's something that I offer each semester. It's an opportunity for young seminarians and also for priests to learn how to work well with the media, to manage tough interviews, to navigate crisis communications, and to learn to better and more effectively spread the message of the church. Media training for priests comes at a very important moment, I think, in the new evangelization because right now more than ever, uh, young priests, seminarians, religious are understanding the importance of the media as a vehicle to help spread the message of Christ and the teachings of the church to the ends of the earth. And we need to be part of the worldwide conversation that's happening on social issues, on religion, on faith. And we can do that by being able to give educated and effective responses to the media when asked. One of the biggest things that I got out of the class was a look into the life of the reporter. This is really uh, an opportunity to encounter another person and through that encounter with this other person to encounter all of the people that they're reporting to. It's also a wonderful opportunity for priests, religious, etc. to be able to share a message of hope and of joy and peace with people who they never would be able to reach from the pulpit because this provides an opportunity to a much wider audience. So many times in my diocese that there are many opportunities that are, that are missed where things could be said so much better uh, when we're communicating the beauty of our faith. And if it's so beautiful, shouldn't we spend so much more time preparing and getting ready for this? So I want to be able to be of use for the diocese in this way. Through interviews, that's when we reach people who don't have any of the same context that we live with uh, whenever we see them in church. These are people that we'll never be able to encounter in the pews, but through a three-minute conversation that they see uh, on the TV here on the radio, they could sense the joy that I want to share with them. They could know that there is indeed uh, an answer to all their questions in life, and that can come just from an interview about what the Pope said. And these communication skills that I teach in my courses are not only specialty skills. These are skills that they can use for homilies, for any public speaking engagement, also for one-on-one -on -one communication. So it's through these that they will better be able to spread the message of the church. None whatsoever. So it was, it was, kind, of a, it was kind of difficult for me. I'm always a little bit nervous when uh, engaging a crowd uh, and engaging. I'm more for one-on-one -on -one sort of situation. So I thought this would be a great way to put myself out there to learn to grow in a new way and be able to talk about just some great things about our faith. What's most important about engaging, engaging the culture is to be certain that what we're talking about is true but also to present it with joy, because that's who we are. We're a people of joy. We, Jesus Christ died for our sins. He came down to, to lead us to a new relationship with Him. And if we can't communicate that which is most important about our lives, then we really have some problems. I've had the opportunity to share this workshop on three continents and to be with people from lay organizations, seminaries, religious organizations, and uh, it, it's just, I've been thrilled by the positive response that I've received to it. Every year, English-speaking priests come for rest, renewal, and formation in Rome. Monsignor Anthony Figueiredo is here to meet them after overseeing the creation of a new video. It aims to draw attention to a twice-yearly program that he says has been invaluable for priests. 
there's no doubt about it. You know, when the priests arrive, they often come very tired. They have huge uh, ministries, very big uh, difficulties, challenges which take place in the world today. And Jesus himself says, come away and rest a while. Come away. We need that time. That was the formation Jesus gave his disciples, in fact. Huh? He used to send them out on mission, and then he'd call them back occasionally and hear from them and form them and answer their questions and strengthen them with prayer. That is exactly what happens here in this program. We bring them back, we listen to them, we dialogue, we form them, and we say, now you've received, go back strengthened to your parishes. Over 3,000 priests have taken part in the program since it began in 1971. Many of them come after working in parishes for over a decade. During their time in the program, the participants have the opportunity to reflect and to study. The priests, uh, the people who come in, uh, the professors from the various universities around Rome, uh, have just uh, shared their knowledge and their information. And, and many of them are very humble. And they often say, look, you are the guys on the front line. You're in the trenches. Uh, we know you experience what we are talking about, what we try to teach seminarians about. So we're here not just to teach you, but we're here to be taught as well. So it's a great rapport that they develop. And in that environment and in that context, great dialogue happens. And, and we learn not just from them, but from the other priests who are a part of the Institute. Uh, so uh, yeah, it's been a very profitable experience in the classroom. But studying is only one part of the program. Coming together in daily prayer, mass and rosary is another. Participants also enjoy the privilege of concelebrating liturgies at St. Peter's Basilica, attending papal liturgies and other spiritual events in and around the Vatican. The goal is to make them even better priests. The priests who come, the priests when they are ordained, are good priests. Uh, but as we know from marriages, as we know from uh, the difficulties of a secularized world, uh, priests today can be discouraged in their ministry. So we want them to stir into flame the gift they received on the ordination day, to rediscover that zeal they had. It's the same in marriages, you know, when couples come to me and say, Father, we cannot live together. And I, I always say to them, go back when you were engaged, go back to the day you got married and remember what God did for you, and it's the same for the priests. That's what we try to do here. They are good priests, but now having had experience, both in formation, having had direct experience in the pastoral field, and now with greater encouragement received here in this program, in Rome, in the heart of the church, with other seminarians, with other priests, they really go back renewed. They begin to live again that newness of life in Jesus that St. Paul talks about. Good priests become better priests. That's what this program does. And it does it well. Every year, 80 priests accept this offer. After up to six weeks of prayer and study in the Eternal City, they return to their parishes, strengthened in faith, and energized to return to their work.